recording on this computer. Is it really doing it though? It says it's recording, sir. All right. So I like to start off by talking about the fact that the language I was speaking at the beginning of this presentation, Kabul Okanagan, in Sakhchin, um, is a critically, critically endangered language. Um, with fewer than 70 first language speakers uh, surviving on earth and uh, the majority of those across the line for us in Canada. And there are zero cases on earth in which a, a language that was that endangered has been revitalized and become the first language of an active language culture community. It has simply never happened. So, um, all of our work and our mission and all of the effort we put in, uh, we're trying to accomplish something that simply has never, ever happened before. But as this slide says, uh, to hell with the facts. We need stories. And our story is that um, we're going to bring this language back. It's going to be a first language of a language culture community once again. Uh, and I am going to be talking a lot about Salish language and our direct experience. So. I just have a, some quick facts about Salish language and even the word Salish. Um, so Salish language is a primary language family in North America. It covers a, a fairly large geographical uh, area when we talk about West Coast languages. So there's Coast Salish and Interior Salish um, ranging all the way up the coast of British Columbia, Bella Coola, down to Tillamook, Oregon all the way to the Continental Divide uh, in Northern British Columbia and in Montana. Uh, a little picture of that is, this is all the range of Salish, Coast Salish, Interior Salish, Bella Coola, Tillamook into Montana, Northern British Columbia. Um, our Salish languages, um, depending on what one calls a language or a dialect, there are 29 Salish languages, um, 22 Coast Salish languages, and seven interior Salish languages. Uh, the three northern interior Salish languages are Shuswap, Lilwap, and Thompson. Um, all their speakers are in British Columbia. Southern interior Salish uh, consists of four distinct languages. The language I was speaking is Colville Okanagan, and it is, we are very much split by the international border there. Um, Moses Columbian or Wenatchee Columbian, and then uh, Coeur d'Alene is the third, and then Spokane, Kalispell, and Montana Salish are a dialect continuum of the fourth Southern Interior Salish language. Um, and we make up quite a few people. The Colville Confederated Tribes, of which my wife is a member, counts, well, now it's more than 10,000 members, 2,100 plus members of the Spokane another 2,000 the Coeur d'Alene tribe, Kalispell tribe. Among all these Salish, contemporary Salish tribes, the direct memberships and their direct descendants, we're talking about 40,000 people who have Southern Interior Salish languages as their heritage language. So the tribes I'm talking about are the Colville Confederated Tribes, the Spokane tribe, the Kalispell tribe, all in the state of Washington, the Coeur d'Alene, and then the Confederate Salish and Pend Oreille tribes are on the Flathead Reservation in Montana. These are the kind of the modern colonial inheritors of all those Southern interior Salish people. Uh, so again, I was talking about the language I was speaking was in Uh Down here, we call it Colville, and in Canada, they call it Okanagan. And so politely, we can call it Colville Okanagan, or Okanagan Colville. Um, there are maybe 70 surviving first language speakers, but many fewer uh, active and uh, able-bodied first language speakers. So in the United States, among the Colville Confederated Tribes, a tribal membership of 10,000 people, we count maybe four surviving first language elders who speak in South Chin. Uh, and there are maybe 15 or 20 able-bodied and culturally active fluent speakers in the Okanagan Valley of 
British Columbia, in my own family, in which my wife and my children and grandchildren are all Sinaites people, um, the language was more abundant in our family for 95 years. No child was raised in the language for 95 years. Uh, and then 12 years ago, uh, my wife and I began to be the full-time childcare of our first grandchild. And so um, when she came to live by us when she was a year old, um, we made a pledge that we would simply not ever speak English to her. Uh, and that is largely hold, held true. She turned 13 this past May, so we talk about a lot of stuff, electric guitars and Harry Potter and the Hunger Games and um, her coming of age ceremonies and you name it. Um, in all that time, we just speak Salish to our grandchildren. There are five of them raging in age from 13 to two years old. Um, and they are all students at our school and we actually co-house with our son. So his two daughters, uh, we see on the daily and speak only to them in Insoch Chin. Um, and I do wanna kind of locate this situation with Insoch Chin. Um, my wife's grandmother was a fluent speaker. Um, her, and my wife also knew her great grandmother who was a fluent speaker of Insoch Chin, uh, but her father was not taught the language at all. It was purposely withheld from him. Um, in the effort to spare him the brutality and the violence that they experienced. Um, and so it was when my wife was in her mid thirties and our kids were quite grown tweens um, when she started on this language journey. And uh, in my previous life, I was a high school Spanish teacher uh, before my wife uh, pulled me into this work. Uh, so in this, this critical language endangerment that we face in Insel Chin, um, that there were virtually no families raising their children in the language again, we clearly understand this is a global phenomenon. Um, depending again, what you call a dialect or language, there are more than 7,000 languages on earth. If my oldest granddaughter lives to be as old as my grandmother did, who lived to be 90, uh, the experts say half those languages will be gone and certainly every single Salish language on earth is counted among those, language, those languages that will be extinct. Um, so why? Um, and there are a lot of simple narratives that just turn on a binary of colonial experience. But when we look around the globe, uh, it's very complicated. So certainly in the case of my family, the genocide against native people in North America is the primary cause for the endangerment of Salish language and of incel Chin. Uh, globally, that's certainly the cause in many places. There are other places where people voluntarily undergo language shift uh, because it's economically advantageous uh, or for other reasons. Um, we have the, we're infamous, I guess, here in the Pacific Northwest Plateau in that we're recognized as a language hotspot due to the, the very, the, the broad diversity of language. There are many, many, many distinct indigenous languages in our region. And then unfortunately, virtually all of them are in steep decline and are facing imminent extinction. Um, and it's really quite striking. Uh, I guess I'm old now because it's just very recent in the United States when a policy of termination, genocide, and cultural extinguishment was the norm. Uh, certainly when I was born in 1965 and the Voting Rights Act was born in the United States, uh, it was still a very dark and genocidal time. And then it was really under the great liberal leader, Richard Nixon, when the termination moved, that was a joke. Anybody get it? No? Canadians, maybe. Uh, it was really only in the mid 70s when there was any kind of policy reversal, the effort on termination and cultural extinguishment ended. 
And, and now suddenly we have this document that's showing on the slide uh, of why it matters. This is now, uh, this is from the National Science Foundation. This is the official uh, policy of the United States government that we should in fact uh, preserve indigenous languages, that they give us insights into unique local knowledge, they actually broaden our understanding of human history, and that they can actually help us trace the capacities of the human mind. Uh, all of which is really striking, given that just a wink of an eye before this, it was a policy of termination and, German, and genocide. Uh, but we're thrilled for this change. If, uh, unfortunately, it's unfunded, you know. Um, and all of that's a little bit complex for me. So we actually talk about why do we need to revitalize and hold on to our indigenous languages in, in simpler terms. Uh, so the folks who I work with here at Sailor School of Spokane, it just comes down to these simple uh, principles. That language is the foundation of cultural identity. And cultural identity is the foundation of human happiness and the creation of beauty. Right? So we want our kids to know who they are. We want them to have good lives. And uh, holding on to their full and true heritage and restoring their full and true heritage is, is an act of uh, decency and acceptance of our kids. So we want them to have a strong sense of themselves so that they can have a beautiful life. And uh, that's a picture of what I mean. Uh, so this is my boss here in the center. That's three of our grandchildren. I have no doubt they're probably, it's a little dated here, this photo, but they're probably looking at something like Dora the Explorer, Thomas Tiger on Netflix. Uh, and what's amazing is that all three of these young girls have always grown up with the language. And although they may be watching uh, something in English or in Spanish, uh, Larea is exclusively speaking to them about it in Salish. And so, and they, they understand that. So that's kind of what it's about for us. And uh, certainly you've taken the time to join our meeting here. So everyone has their reasons. And I'm, I, I assume I'm preaching to the choir in this entire presentation that we, uh, we are all moved to hold on to this heritage and to strengthen our children's lives, our grandchildren's lives, our communities, um, just so that we can all have it good. So one of the big things that, uh, so it was, like I said, 20 years ago, um, my wife was actually called to the funeral of her grandmother's brother. And, uh, her, both her great-grandmother and grandmother had already passed away. She was called to attend her great-uncle's funeral, the last of those siblings. Um, and she went to Joe Barr's funeral at Kettle Falls, Juanit. And at the funeral, someone stood up, as is often the case, and said, uh, this man was a fluent speaker of our language. The language is going away. Who is going to stand up and and take on that responsibility of making sure our languages are passed on, our language is passed on. And my wife was shocked um, because her uncle Joe was the one who taught her to play the guitar. He was the one that taught her to ride a horse. And yet she had never heard him speak in Sochchin. And she didn't know he spoke. Uh, she was aware that her grandmother was fluent. She assumed some of her uh, aunts and uncles did not speak because they never spoke. Um, and she was really shocked, but also somehow moved. She talks about it with a Salish word, uh, would translate as maybe heart struck. Um, she just, I, and I remember, I didn't go to this funeral. I remember her coming home and said, I'm going to learn my language. And, and I had no idea what that meant. I'd certainly never heard a word of it. Um, I don't know that she had knew any words, not even one word of her language at that time. I was a high school Spanish teacher and I thought, oh yeah, learn a language, yeah, you can do that. And I had no idea what, I, what was going on. Um, but she's kind of held to that idea. So she began a journey of trying to connect with how could she learn her language? No one in her family, that was the last speaker in her family who had passed away 
without her knowing he was a speaker. Uh, so she began this journey that took her to the Spokane Indian Reservation and a sister language, the Kalispell Indian Reservation, learning a sister language, and finally an opportunity at OMAC on the Colville Confederate Tribes, the reservation there, which was her home reservation. And she was able to connect with a fluent elder there, Sam Titsa, and actually begin learning her grandmother's language, the language of her family. Um, and this was, a, this was a heck of a journey. Um, so it started, like I said, uh, around the year 2000. In 2005, we uh, sold our house in the States and left our jobs and moved to Canada is, I think the polite word is undocumented immigrants. Um, and we lived in Canada for two years with Sam Titsa in order to learn the language and be, you know, strengthen our own fluency. Um, and we made so many mistakes. We wasted so much time, so much money uh, as we went through that journey um, because there was no clear roadmap of how, how do you learn a critically endangered language? And of course, we're encountering all of the complicated social and emotional landscape of, uh, of our community, which is a post-genocidal community that's carrying forward uh, that pain and then the strength of survival. So it's very complicated. And uh, I think it was the second year we were, we were living with Sam Tietze in the Smilkamich, in the Smilkameen Valley, British Columbia. We went back down south and Larray was in a winter dance. And uh, I stayed back and in a cabin because I had found this book. I found a book by Joshua Fishman with this crazy title, Reversing Language Shift, Theoretical and Empirical Foundations of Assistance to Threatened Languages. Um, I forgot how I came across the book, but I, I read it that weekend. It's a big fat book. And while she was in her winter dance, um, I read this book and I was just blown away by it because uh, Joshua and Fishman just very carefully documented all the mistakes that we had made <laughs> so far in our journey. Uh, and they were many. And he, and he had a great uh, understanding of how we wasted our time and money um, in our quest to become fluent speakers and pass this language on to our children and grandchildren. And so it was just really striking. And the biggest thing I take away from, that we took away from Fishman, and of course, many scholars have built on his work now and expanded his work, but we were so struck by his GIDS, his Graded Intergenerational Disruption Scale. And as I say, other scholars have worked with this extensively uh, since this, that time. Um, but it was amazing to us. And I, I wanna take a few moments to talk about it. Um, in his GIDS, he talks about levels of endangerment. Uh, and maybe a stage one language would be like French in Canada. Uh, we can't really talk about it as being an endangered language. Um, but it's not the preeminent dominant language of Canada. And so um, we could call a language in that situation, a stage one language. The worst off languages in Fishman's work are stage eight languages. Uh, languages that just have a few culturally isolated speakers left. Uh, typically they're not speaking with other speakers um, and they're, very few of them are culturally active. At stage seven, there are some culturally active speakers, but there are few or no young people learning the age and few or no children growing up in the language. So uh, stage seven languages are moribund. There is not intergenerational transmission of the language. And then it was kind of interesting to, Fishman has helped us get this framework that our goal is not French in Canada. Our goal is not to become a stage one language community but rather stage six is the kind of the natural state of language culture communities across the globe. So a stage six language means that there is a, a cogent language culture community and that all generations speak the language. And uh, it helped us understand and be inspired because like around here in Spokane, there's a Hutterite colony um, just outside of the city of Spokane and they are very much a stage six language community. 
Um, their language is stable. All generations speak their language. They're a trilingual, uh, a triglossic community in which they speak a low German dialect um, as their daily language. Their religion is written in Hofdeutsch, High German, and then they're all fluent in English as a second language. And that's a stage six language, and that's what we aspire to. Uh, and we actually don't need schools or government. We don't need to have the clerk at Walmart talk in self chin to us. But what we're really looking for is a strong language culture community in which all generations are speaking the language and we're bound together with a shared culture and community. Uh, and that, that actually cleared up a lot of things. And the thing about Fishman, he says, since that is in fact our goal when we're doing language revitalization, then we have to calibrate our strategies, our spending, our use of resources to achieve that goal. Um, and, there's, and there's not really another goal um, for those who truly want to be part of a revitalized language culture community. Um, so for ourselves, um, of our four Southern Interior Salish languages, uh, one of our sister languages, Coeur d'Alene, has no surviving first language speakers. So we're strictly in a position of trying to do language reconstruction um, with Coeur d'Alene. Another one of our sister languages uh, in Khamchin, Moses, Columbia, has a single surviving first language speaker who has not had a conversation with another first language speaker for seven years. And so a very, very difficult situation. Kavalo Okanagan in South Chin, which is the language uh, I speak in my family. Spokane Kalispell, uh, it, what Cheney's language that he was speaking to begin, uh, are both stage seven languages, but uh, very much in danger of being stage eight languages. And then our, uh, our, our sister community, a uh, language isolate, Kootenai, is in the same situation, uh, that just down to a handful of a culturally active speakers. Uh, and we have no stage six indigenous languages in the state of Washington or in the state of Idaho. And uh, it's getting pretty rough even in Crow and Cheyenne country in Montana. So we know the, the task before us. Um, and the, another awesome thing about our discovery of Fishman and may, all of you may be old hands, but it was, it was just revel, it was such a revelation to us to hear, um, we just done trial and error for a decade, maybe. Um, and it was just amazing to see it laid out, case study after case study, uh, with kind of the, uh, the conceptual framework around why these things are not working or why they are working. Uh, and so we had some really strong takeaways um, that partly they matched all the stuff we had learned through hard knocks and by failing and trying again and failing and then finally figuring a few things out. Uh, but Fishman just kind of makes it clear and we certainly have come to believe also that if you're in the situation where you're in stage eight of your language, you need to be very careful about how you use your limited resources and that these are the strategies that really actually can make a difference for a stage eight language. Our focus is creating new fluent speakers, reconstructing the language, recording elders, addressing important cultural topics, but our primary task is to design and implement a fluency transfer system. And uh, unfortunately, most stage eight indigenous language communities in the Pacific Northwest, in the Northwestern United States, in British Columbia is where I have experienced Yukon territory as well, um, are simply investing in other strategies, even though their languages are stage eight languages. Uh, they're investing in uh, schooling and uh, media and technology. And the evidence is clear from Fishman's case studies and from continuing scholarship. There's not a single highly endangered indigenous language that has ever been revitalized using a schooling model or using an app or using a radio show or a, et cetera. Uh, the success is only coming from building and implementing a fluency transfer system. Stage seven, it's the same thing. Um, we still have to build and implement that fluency transfer system. And then we really work 
to create new fluent speakers who are raising children, whether that's young parents or grandparents who have their grandchildren. Um, if we can empower people to raise their children in the language, we will have new first language speakers. Uh, and then the notion is that the new speakers can come together and begin to reform an authentic language culture community. Um, and I, we also love Fishman because uh, he is pretty blunt and just said, most efforts to reverse language shift, most efforts to revitalize indigenous languages all around the world are failures across the board. Even famous cases that we, uh, people point to as very successful, when we look at the hard data, we see languages that are still in decline. Um, and he specifically talks about, you have to match the, language, the level of endangerment your language is facing uh, with the strategies you're engaging in, the way you're spending your resources. So if you're a stage seven or eight uh, language, um, he really questions these kinds of activities that are in this slide being the dominant language revitalization strategy. I wanna say a few things because I've put in will kill underlined all caps in red so you get my message, right? But I wanna make clear I have done and or am doing every single one of these things that are on this slide, um, um, except a radio show. But now we've just started putting our Salish word of the day on the local radio station. So I think I got them all now. We are now doing all of these things. These things are not bad things. These are not bad behaviors. What I'm saying is that if these are your dominant language revitalization strategies, then your language will expire. These will fail. These uh, behaviors as dominant language revitalization strategies have a track record of failure. So immersion schooling that does not connected to a program that also creates fluent adults, um, we have, there's, there's overwhelming evidence that it doesn't lead to language revitalization, that it doesn't actually lead to uh, even the beginning of a language culture community. Uh, it just ends up creating isolated, it, it, it perpetuates stage seven and eight um, reality. Public school programs, there are zero public school programs that have led to the revitalization of any endangered indigenous language, literally none, anywhere, ever, um, even in Hawaii. Uh, casual community classes, culture events with language, college classes, text, app, web, and linguistic studies, right? Um, if these are the dominant language revitalizing strategies for a, a stage seven or eight community, um, we can accurately predict that language will decline further and eventually be extinct. Um, and so our big takeaway on Fishman was, this is the question. Whenever we're doing our work for language revitalization, whenever we're writing a funding proposal, whenever we're spending the resources or using the time of our elders in our community and expending our cultural resources, this is the question we're trying to answer, right? What am I doing right now that is empowering people to raise their children in the language again, right? And, and sometimes it's not a perfect answer. Well, I'm, I'm treading water, I'm keeping this afloat so that the next generation can become, first, can become language speakers and they can raise children in language and they'll be the first language speakers of our future. You know, it, it's okay. But if you can't follow that tread and say, you know, if it's not directly obvious that I'm, what I'm doing right now is gonna create new fluent speakers who are empowered and have the capacity to raise children in the language, uh, then we, we probably need a new tactic and a new strategy. Um, so I've been talking about a fluency transfer system. Um, and what is that? So it's a system. I think you know what fluency is. We call that the F word. Nobody likes to use the F word. F this, F that. Are you F'd? I'm not F'd, no way. They said you're F'd, right? 
My wife uh, has five grandchildren, age and age from age two to age 12. She never tells people, and she only speaks to them in insult chain, but she never tells people, she doesn't use the F word because it's just too loaded. But I think we should use that word. That is our goal. We all want to be effed. We all want to be fluent, right? Um, so, and it's a transfer system. In other words, there are people who are fluent. There are fluent speakers, and we want them to, sh we want that capacity, that proficiency, that fluency to come to other people. And it's a system. And it's a system because it's replicable and predictable. If it might work out, if it could happen, maybe uh, it's not really a system. And we desperately need reliable, predictable systems in which people can become fluent in the near term. And so that we can really work to recreate that language culture community in which all generations are speaking a language inside of a loving community. Uh, a fluency transfer system is based on people living the language together. So it's not uh, an academic exercise and it's not um, an a controlled experiment in gaining power inside of other kinds of systems. It's really about, we are going to live in the language. It may or may not include a curriculum. Our fluency sa uh, transfer system, our Salish fluency transfer system does include a, a curriculum because uh, we have very few speakers and we have very elderly speakers, and uh, th that's been the way for us. But there are other ways. Uh, I remember hearing the story of our colleagues on the Grand Ronde in Oregon, in which they really, uh, they had a fluency transfer system that was based on a couple of very dynamic elderly speakers taking in some young people and just putting them through Chinook Wah Wah boot camp and they washed dishes and they cut wood and they they conducted ceremony and they just and these dynamic speakers had the ability to just do a natural approach and and bring these young people to fluency um, and unfortunately we just don't have that resource um, so we haven't been able to do that kind of fluency transfer system I know um, some of our colleagues a little further up uh, carrier speakers uh, in British Columbia, they have the numbers where their fluency transfer system can be based on that kind of uh, approach, a natural full immersion master apprentice approach. Um, and so a fluency transfer system can be based on that kind of model without a curriculum per se, but it must still be systematic. It still must be replicable and predictable if it's going to have the outcome of a new fluent speakers who can form, reform a language culture community. Uh, and we're always working to connect new fluent speakers with fluent elders or other fluent knowledge keepers if it's a fluency transfer system. So is TPR a fluency system? It's, you, you, you know it's not. So the reason we have added this slide is because we were we ourselves were pulled off track many times using our resources to focus on teaching methodology and teach uh, and training people to certain methods or learning certain methods ourselves when really the problem was uh, we didn't know the language and didn't matter how good I was at TPRS or accelerated second language acquisition method or where are my keys. It's just that we didn't know Salish. Um, and so no matter how much we might be proficient in a particular methodology, but all of these methodologies are empty. They have no linguistic or cultural content. Uh, and so a fluency transfer system has to be full. It has to be rich. It has to be replete with linguistic and cultural information. Uh, and unfortunately, a huge amount of time and money is still being pulled out of our communities and people are going to oh like Oregon State University Summer Institute um, and a bunch of other similar places um, that are focusing on methodology um, when in fact these endangered language communities have no systematic approach they have no 
depth of documentation of the language that is accessible to second language learners. And so focusing on methods just has burned through uh, generations worth of cultural and financial resources. Um, and when we just focus on teaching methodology rather than a fluency transfer system, our languages languish and die. So I have a little metaphor. I, I hope it, uh, I usually really walk around the room and make a, quite the production here out of this wee story. And this is actually a story I developed. Um, I think uh, Brett Easterbrook is in our call today. Um, and working with uh, the good people at Sumina's First Nation on Vancouver Island um, was the, the t where we kind of developed this, this little talk about car sales and cartography. So there is a, our experience working in endangered language communities, our own work to try to become fluent speakers and, and restart intergenerational transmission inside of our own family uh, has been really difficult and full of all kinds of, as I said, wasted time and efforts. And, um, and we kind of came up with this, this little story about, about framing what goes on or what has gone on in our communities. So the story goes like this. Uh, there is this beautiful place, this beautiful place. You know, in my family, Sinaites, so we always talk about it's right up north in, that, in the lost territories in Canada, a few hours from here. And it's just beautiful. And that there's this one place. It's a mythical place. It's the most amazing cove on Upper Arrow Lake. And there's a waterfall that flows down into it. And the cedar forest there is just stunning. Old growth, 10 people putting their arms around one of these trees. It's like the, it's nirvana. It's the promised land. And in that place resides a fluent speaker who has all, who's just rich with all of the lived experience of the traditional language and culture. And, it, and, and in, that, in that special place, in that cove with this beautiful meadow leading out before the forest that has all of our roots, all of our plants, everything beautiful. The caribou still come down out of the forest and graze the edge. It's just this beautiful place. And here is this fluent elder there who can tell you every bit of that. They can describe every plant and animal in that beautiful place in Nirvana, in Kathmandu. They can talk about each leaf, each bug, each fly, the way it's interconnected, the way that... Uh, Everything goes together with the language and culture in that place. And of course, they have this beautiful sweat right there on the shore, right? And in the back of the meadow in the back, they still have their bright, beautiful Thule longhouse. Everything is as, is as it should be. And there they are. And the amazing thing is they have a cell phone too. They've got the latest technology, excellent signal. They have five bars. So here we are down in Spokane. And we're in touch with our elder. Oh, wow, wow. We'll call her Pila Sis. Pila Sis is there and she has, she's got it all. She lives in this place. She lives in this beautiful place and she has it all and it's all in the language. And we can call her and kind of talk to her and get a sense of it. And like, we're like, oh my God, we must go there. We must go there. But we don't know how to get there. And here's the thing. She's never been to Spokane, and she doesn't know how you get from Spokane to this amazing, magical cove up on Upper Arrow Lake. So how do I get there? Well, we start talking about how bad we want to go there, and then a car salesman pops up, and they've heard, hey, you guys want to take a trip? Hey, I'm going to sell you this. Look at this beautiful blue monster here. It's got everything. It's got four-wheel drive, it's, it's comfortable, it's got AC, it's got heat, it's got a, a bump in sound system. This is the car you need to get you there. We buy that car, we save up, we, we cash in, we sell the house, we buy this vehicle. We take off, headed towards the beautiful promised land. Our elder's waiting, she's like, come on, I'm gonna give everything to you, let's go. And we take off and we kind of head up into the first range of mountains 
and we drive around and we go here and, and we drive for days, but we don't know the way over. We don't know where the pass is to get us over this. So we go back. Uh, and of course we say, this car's no good. It didn't take us there. It, it doesn't have what we needed to get across the, the first pass. So we buy a different car and, and, and we'll make it red this time. And uh, it's got all the latest adjustable seats, heated leather seats. We take off. This car is going to get us where we go. We take off. Now, we did do a, some exploration. And so we go back up the way we came. We think maybe if we head a little to the west, and sure, it's, we find a pass. And we're able to drop down. And then we see, like, oh, it's a valley here. There's a river. There's another uh, set of mountains there that we're going to have to get across. But we have to get our way down. We're looking to find a safe way down. And we just come, and it's just a cliff. We can't really see it. We have to go back. Uh, we go back up. We go, we go to the pass where we came down. We come down that hill. Uh, how are we going to get over this mountains? This, this vehicle was no good. Another car salesman appears. It's yellow. It's yellow. It's beautiful. It's got a moon roof this time. It's fantastic. It's got all the buzzers and bells. It, it plays Dixie when we push a button for the horn. It's just phenomenal. Uh, we get this newest car, the latest vehicle for getting us there. We take off now. We have wandered those mountains quite a bit. We go over the pass, and we know if we go that way, we're going to hit the cliffs again. So, again, we, we do find a way down. We get to the river. Uh, there's just no way to cross. We can't find it. We're driving up and down the river. Uh, we can't find a place where we can get across. Uh, this car's no good. We head back. You see where I'm going? Uh, it's not the vehicle. I don't need a car. I need a cartograph. For us to achieve, to us to make it to the promised land so that we can be in that amazing place that has, it's just beautiful cove with every plant and critter and animal and bug with the sweat and the longhouse, the Thule longhouse at the back of the meadow. Everything's right. The caribou are there. Everything is restored and whole in this beautiful place. It's not that we need a vehicle to get there. We could get there on foot if we knew the way. Our task in building a fluency transfer system is not to learn a method. It's not to learn an approach. What we actually have to do is construct a map. Uh, and the approach is different than, than buying one of these fancy cars and then trying to get there in that car. The approach is more methodical and uh, a lot harder, uh, a lot less flashy, and uh, a lot more beautiful. So I, what I want to do is build a cartograph. I have to map the territory between where I am and where that promised land is. Uh, and what we find out is... You know, that first hill I went up and we kind of went wandering and found the first pass. Actually, there's a lot of interesting stuff there. Uh, and we can document uh, all of the plants and animals and the ways of being uh, in that first descent. And we can map that out. Um, and we've actually kind of explored that part ourselves. Um, so we can get right at that, and it's pretty accessible, but we do want to build a map so that anybody who comes after us does not have to wander around up there and try and find that pass to get over the first hill. Uh, and we can be on the phone, and we kind of got a sense of ourselves, and we can be on the phone, and we could record what, what our elder says about each of those things. And, and now that we're not just trying to get there uh, in a rush, we actually can, can document all of our wanderings very nicely and kind of get a first pass, and here's the first pass, and, and this will get you down to the river. And if we stay in touch with our elder and record this, and we document each and every plant that we find along the way, and we engage in the cultural practices and protocols um, that match that landscape that we're passing through, and we document that with care and with loving care, in, in, when we're in touch with our fluent elder, and we record and we build out that map, and it has understandings of the terrain and the wildlife and the, and, the, and the fauna and the features of how all of those plants and animals and practices go together. 
Uh, that's actually what we're talking about when we talk about building a fluency transfer system. Um, once we have that mapped out, once that's documented, once uh, our elder has guided us through that cultural and, and biological and spiritual terrain, and we've documented it as we've gone, um, they'll guide us right there. We'll be wandering, but we're on the phone and we can discuss and document all the different aspects of the terrain we're following through. And it will be challenging, but with that guidance and that constant input that we document and record and preserve, um, we go and, and regardless of our vehicle, whether we're on foot or uh, just pushing a wheelbarrow or in our, in our jalopy or in, in this delightful uh, Hummer, uh, we will get there. And when we get there, there'll be this detailed, rich map behind us. And, you know, the next person who comes along, they can, they can add to that and they can be in touch. Uh, and then we can start going back and forth across this rich terrain that's full of all this beauty and all this depth and transformative cultural practices. And each pass, we can put in more detail and make it map more clear. And pretty soon, people will just be able to go and they'll be there, and they can actually be in what we understand is a kind of nirvana, a rich physical landscape that is uh, made alive by our presence, our cultural presence, and our interaction with all of the all of the living beings, from the microscopic to the caribou and the grizzly, can all be in play inside of a cultural expression. That's what it means to build a fluency transfer system. Uh, so I don't know. That's my story. One of, the, uh, one of the things that we had no idea about our work in language revitalization is, well, how incredibly difficult it would be and also how different language revitalization work is from just providing community language services. So uh, almost every one of our communities is working very hard, some people working very, very hard um, to bring back our languages, to hold on to our languages. And unfortunately, lots of our efforts go into community language services and, and less of our efforts go into language revitalization work. So again, language revitalization work, it's all about can we reconstruct and empower our language culture community in which all generations are speaking the language. Intergenerational transmission of the language is the holy grail of all of our work. When people are raising their kids in the language again, when people are connected through a language culture community, uh, then we don't have to do language revitalization work. Then we can do stage three things or stage four things. Um, and we were very struck, and these slides I am presenting right now really come out of a conversation with our partners uh, uh, with the Children of the Taku Society and the interior Clinket revitalization effort being led by some young people out of Atlin, British Columbia and Whitehorse, Yukon Territory. Um, and so we can understand that when we're doing language revitalization work, we're actually doing community building work. And when we do that community building work, our language revitalization work is, is successful. That's what actually powers it. Something we did not understand when we started our work and that is very evident every day here now as we are, are continuing our work. So language revitalization work is relational. It's all about relationships with people. Uh, you, we have to engage with people in the long run if we're gonna create new fluent, highly fluent speakers. Our community language services, like we can just have a class and people can come and go and I might never see you again. And that's typical of community language services. Um, we're building community. So our work is not just like, oh, you did this course and now you're done. Hope to see you again someday. Um, we can't have isolated activities and programs. We have to build a community that means we stay in relationship. Um, when we do language revitalization work, we have to be focused on the end game, deeply fluent, new, advanced speakers of the language. 
Um, so much of our work in community language services, we just have lots of beginners and lots of people who are plateaued out at an intermediate level. Um, but language revitalization, we have to have advanced, fluent speakers who are culturally competent. And we have to believe that that's possible and we have to build the fluency transfer systems that make it possible. Um, when we're doing language revitalization work, we're learning the language. And a lot of community language services um, learn about the language. So uh, for adult learners, if you're feeling really comfortable in language class, and it's really interesting to talk about how the language did this or that, uh, you're probably not learning because most adult learners are very uncomfortable when they're actually being pushed to advance their language proficiency. And adult speakers in particular are very good at trying to ease that pressure and spend time learning about the language rather than spending time actually learning the language and being forced to do verbal exchanges inside of immersion, right? Another hallmark of language revitalization work that we've learned is that it is bound but inclusive. And our language community services, language, uh, community language services, which tend not to lead to language revitalization, are typically unbound but end up being exclusive. So what am I talking about? So at Sailor School of Spokane, our work is bound. It has boundaries. For instance, a child cannot attend our school unless their parent comes to 60 hours of language class per year. That's six zero. So uh, 60 hours a year is not enough to become fluent, but it, it means you have skin in the game. So our parents have to come to class three out of four weeks throughout the school year. And if they don't, if they're unable to, um, then we kick their kid out of our school. And it's horrible. It's horrible for us. It's horrible for the child. The parents are almost always very angry. But we have that strict boundary because we know that investing $20,000 per year in each child, it will not yield the outcome we desire if the parents are also not learners. And we know that. And there's, there's zero cases on earth in which children were taught the language, but their parents weren't, and then those children saved the language. It's never happened, and the odds are it will never happen. And we know that. So we have this strict boundary, and it kills us. Um, we love our kids. It takes about 10 days. Um, and when they can't come here anymore because their parents aren't into it, uh, it's devastating for all parties, and yet we do it anyway. It's bound. Our school is also inclusive because literally anybody who applies and gets on the wait list and makes that commitment to learn language, their kid can attend our school, uh, regardless of their tribal background, regardless of their blood quantum, regardless of actually anything. If you're into it and you sign up and you are willing to pay the tuition and you are willing to learn the language, uh, you're in. And unfortunately, community language services often appear to be unbound. So anyone can come to class. Oh, the culture committee's having class at the Longhouse. Anybody can come. Sure, anybody can come, right? Um, but then some people come and they're not really welcome because who are you? I don't know you. What? You're the spouse of some tribal descendant? I don't know. I, yeah, I mean, you can stay, whatever. But it becomes quite clear that the lack of boundaries actually have a bunch of exclusive elements. Uh, another crazy thing about Sailor School of Spokane, it's just unfolding for us this month, as we have a young man uh, who we hired as our accountant. And just like every other staff member at Sailor School of Spokane, he's required to go to Salish language training class 90 minutes per day as part of his job. And he has to be on a fluency track in order to be an employee of Sailor School of Spokane. And well, he really likes it. He doesn't get to interact with the kids. He's not in one of our immersion apprentice situations, but he really is doing very well. And he wanted to teach. So he is now teaching our Saturday Salish for parents. Every Saturday morning from 9 to 1130, there's a Salish language class for parents to take. And this young man 
is uh, being trained to take over teaching that beginning class. And he's got flaming red head, red hair, and he's an Irish kid. He's not Salish. He's not native, not even brown. Um, and people think that is kind of outrageous. Now, he's married to a Coeur d'Alene tribal member who also works for us, and uh, he's into it, and he supports his wife, and they want to raise their kids in Salish one day. Um, but there's just an awful lot of communities that cannot tolerate that situation, where there's a non-Native person stepping forward to actually teach Native people uh, their own language. And that's where, unfortunately, our community language services because they're not focused on forming a language culture community and actually enacting successful language revitalization, they can end up being quite exclusive. Uh, because they, uh, and right, and it's not, uh, it's not some terrible thing anyone did. We fully understand that our communities continue to bear the trauma and the, and the scars of being people who survive genocide. Uh, and so it's not like somebody's doing a bad thing. We understand that if we don't carefully focus and refocus our work continually with the focus on authentic language revitalization, whose goal is the formation of a language culture community in which all generations are speaking and using the language inside of a cultural framework. Uh, if that's not our clear and intended goal without our work, we can fall into community language services that are unbound. Like, sure, anybody can walk in the door. People can walk. They can come in and out. You know, they can talk while somebody's teaching. They can kind of, you know, um, not be respectful. It's very open. But then it also has all these exclusive elements about who gets to teach, who can be certified by the tribe or the band, who has the pedigree to be a teacher or a learner. Um, and those things tend not to be as operative when we're talking about community building and taking care of kids together. Um, and so our young man, you know, he's going to be the father of Salish children, uh, they say. And so obviously he needs to be brought into the community and educated and be a fluent speaker and be taught. Uh, and then he needs to do the work of helping others in the community through his own teaching. Language revitalization always has strong language domains, places where the language is eminent, where English is turned off, that are sacred, regardless of what they look like, and that we recognize that the language is going to have a home and we're gonna stay in the language in this place or in this situation. Community language services, it's very difficult to establish a strong language domain. We have limited domains. Oh. I'm going to greet everybody for the first five minutes of class before I start giving an explanation of the morphology of this word in English. Um, language revitalization, as I have said over and over, has strong intergenerational use and transmission. That's the gold, you know, that's the gold standard. That's the holy grail. Our community language services tend to be isolated. We teach kids at school. Uh, the parents come to this, uh, well, you know, the, the meat drying workshop. There's some language there. Um, but we're, we're not being intentional about this kid's learning, so this kid's parent must be learning, or this speaker has children who need to learn, and then their grandchildren need to be connected so we can reestablish an intergenerational language culture community. And I would like to uh, assert that language revitalization work ends up being transcendental in, in, and transformative. Um, we have had this happen. People come into language, they need a job, right? We hire them, they learn language. And then they're, we have one employee kind of get mad and met with us and said, this was a trick and you're ruining my life. I'm fighting with my spouse. I've, it's changing me. It's, 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 I don't think the way I used to think. And of course, in our heads, we're like, yeah. Um, but they were actually kind of actually freaked out um, because we really do fundamentally believe this. The reason we want to pursue language revitalization and not community language services is because it will bring back the language. And when you bring back the language, 
you have no choice. You will begin to bring back the culture and you will, all the learners will be challenged in their value systems and what they're doing with their life. Um, we have some newly sober people who they were language learners, but they were still smoking a lot of reefer, um, self-medicating. And over the course of years, they've slacked off and they, they're more sober. And uh, they can't even talk about why that is. But we think it's because that's what happens when you're part of a community, when you begin to, uh, when, you, when you learn the language, there's, it's like there's a cultural writer that's coming with it. You simply can't learn the language without uh, being inoculated with cultural ideas and cultural values. And that's the very power of language realization. That's why we like to say it's the most, when we do this kind of language realization work, it's the most effective way you can get at sobriety. And uh, it's the best effective way you can get at better domestic relationships. And, and we would uh, assert that it's the best way you can get at ecological restoration. It's the, one of the best ways you can get at economic development because language revitalization is uniquely able to uh, bring with it values and cultural protocols that are, that are, um, they're, they're a writer along with the language and they end up being, uh, you know, the learners become inoculated with certain kinds of cultural ideas and values. And if we come together in a community and reinforce that in an upfront and an obvious way, then it really becomes uh, very powerful. And in that way, it undermines toxic nostalgia. I'll give you some examples of the toxic nostalgia that we face at least once a week. People will say to things like this, well, my grandma never had a word for TV. You know, and, and it's like, yeah, neither did mine because TV was invented and popularized in the 1950s. Literally no one on earth had a word for TV in 1940 because there was no such thing. When they're saying that to us, what they're saying is your efforts are not culturally sanctioned and you are an illegitimate language learner. And they're trying to hearken back to us some other time when the language was pure, when the people were pure, when the culture was pure. That same person might also say to us, what, the way you're saying that word for caribou, I, that's not how my grandma said it. Oh, what did she say? Oh, I don't know. I don't, I don't speak the language. I don't remember what she said. What are you talking about? You're, you're critiquing new learners' pronunciation and word usage, but then you also say that you're not a speaker and you don't remember what your grandma said. Again, what they're saying is, your work is not culturally sanctioned. Your work is stepping outside of the freeze frame of the moment of contact. It is not that pure essential moment before colonial contact, and therefore it's illegitimate. It's toxic nostalgia because one, uh, our understanding of that moment of contact is understandably limited and open to broad interpretation. And usually it's a club that's used to beat people down, right? It's interesting, if you're doing community language services, um, it's very difficult to disrupt toxic nostalgia. It's difficult to draw people in from that place of you know, critiquing other people or questioning the cultural sanction of other learners. If it's just so casual or if it's, it's hard to interrupt that. But when we really say, hey, we're gonna become speakers. We're gonna turn off English. Everybody's gonna speak their best Salish. 
And we are going to speak to the kids and teach them everything we can. And we are committed to one another. We're going to be in this relationship. It's not that we like each other. It's not even that we can stand each other. It's just that we need you. You know, we need each other. And if we're going to make a language culture community and raise our kids in this beautiful way. Um, and so we have to confront toxic nostalgia. And oddly enough, when that's happening, um, when we take our kids somewhere, we almost never hear that stuff. We almost never hear it because wow, like these kids know the language and they only speak the language and they're doing this thing. They're, they're bringing back the ceremony on the river for the salmon. It's like, we never hear that kind of stuff. It's individual learners, especially people without pedigree, that tribal descendant, they really get hammered by that stuff. Um, and so language revitalization and community making and the formation of a language of, an, of a renewed language culture community really undermines toxic nostalgia. And I don't mean it keeps those bad people away. I'm talking about ourselves. We are the ones who engage in toxic nostalgia. And when we come together, when we bring ourselves together, we tend not to do it to each other uh, anymore because we all inherit that, that, that uh, reference to toxic nostalgia. These, these cultural weapons, um, that same, so what we're doing is bringing people in who might have, we might have said that in the past, but now, wow, I'm actually learning and speaking and I have to talk to these kids and I have made this promise that I'll always speak to my family in the language. So, um, and that we do own a TV, so we will go ahead and describe that part of our life and uh, that's okay. And we really believe in that, that successful language revitalization is, uh, leads to protective factors because the thing we've really learned in the last five years is we used to just talk about, it. you have to build a fluency transfer system. You have to have that transfer system and then you can create new speakers. And what we've learned is, uh, and man, it's no more true than it is now with Donald Trump and COVID-19 co-occurring in our lives. Uh, we actually can't learn the language unless we have a system of care that goes along with our fluency transfer system. Uh, over and over at Sayers School of Spokane, we have had to broaden our mission, broaden our, our programming to offer people all kinds of support so that they can stay in our language culture community. So our, our folks go homeless and we have to help them with housing. Um, and our folks... Uh, get arrested and we have to do lawyers in bail and our folks struggle with addiction and substance abuse. So we have to do interventions and treatment. Um, and then some people just have, you know, something horrible happens. They've been, their parents have passed away unexpectedly and they're orphaned. And so we have to be their parents and, or they've lost a, a child, a baby, and uh, we have to be there for them. They're that we, it, it's not, you know, they just can't enroll in a, the schooling program or in the technical aspects of a, a, a language transfer system. We have to create and sustain a system of care that goes along with that. Um, and there's a, we have 31 adults in our daily intensive Salish language training program in which they're in language class for 90 minutes a day. They have an hour of study time and then they're working in their job for five and a half hours a day. And most of them, their job is an immersion placement um, with kids in which they have to turn off English and use the language to interact and care for and, and teach kids. Uh, our accountant just has to put up with my bad jokes in the office and say for his immersion. But when we build a language revitalization program, we have to have a fluency transfer system as its foundation, but ultimately that also does not succeed unless we have a system of care that goes along with it. And that's where we're really, we're really talking about building a language culture community that is relational. Um, and again, it doesn't mean we like each other or sometimes can't even stand each other, but it means we've made that commitment 
um, to be there for each other so that we can all stay in the game and we can raise kids in the language and hopefully arrive at the time where we have intergenerational transmission of our language and new first language speakers uh, who are deeply connected inside of a cultural community. Um, and good language revitalization work, uh, it leads to that. So I wanna talk specifically about the Salish fluency transfer system and curriculum that has been developed um, by Salish School of Spokane and the Paul Creek Language Association. The Paul Creek Language Association is a small British Columbia society that um, we formed when we were living there as illegals with our elder Sam Titsa and her family. Uh, and, the, and so Sam Titsa, we returned to Washington and formed Sailor School of Spokane, and these two organizations continue to partner to create this fluency transfer system. Um, so our system is a three-legged stool, and uh, a three-legged stool is unique from a four-legged stool because a four-legged stool can lose a leg and it'll still stand. Um, our, our system is very much a three-legged stool. You take away one of those legs and it does fall down. So we have a, a comprehensive Salish curriculum that we have built and continue to build. That curriculum is taught by apprentice speakers. We do not ask our fluent speakers to teach it um, because it's generally a waste of our cultural resource and they're usually bad at it. Um, and then we really push for cultural immersion with fluent elders and other fluent speakers uh, and knowledge keepers. And then we have to have, number three, we have to have language domains in which we turn off English. And uh, turning off English and creating a language domain, some, for some folks, it's a physical place. Our son tells us that that is his thing. He is our uh, lead elementary teacher in our school, and he is absolutely inflexible in his classroom from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. all day every day he never ever speaks English ever and uh, he's just absolutely dogmatic about it and he enforces on his apprentice on his apprentice teachers as well and it's a very very strong language domain and uh, the kids are forced to speak the language inside that language domain and then he apologizes because he gets off work and his wife is also a fluent speaker and both his children know the language and are, uh, they understand everything he could possibly say to him, but he's exhausted at the end of the day and he goes home and he speaks English. Um, because, you know, it's hard to stay married and you don't want to beat your kids too often without a frustration. And so, but he maintains a very strong language domain from 9 to 4 p.m. and then he's weaker. Uh, my wife and I speak English to each other a lot and always have um, because it's hard to stay married. But when we took in that first grandchild, when our daughter went to medical school, uh, the joke is that we decided, but really she mandated that we would never speak English to that child. And that became our language domain and it became wacky and ironic so our daughter has this child who we never speak english with we only speak to her in salish and constantly our daughter's around us doing that so she has a very high level of salish comprehension but we speak english to her so i, I turn to my granddaughter i turn to her uh, granddaughter uh what do you want to eat are you hungry and then i turn to my daughter and say are you hungry too when she would understand it if I said it in Salish, but that's just the, not the nature of the domain that we created and committed to. But to become fluent inside of our transfer system, you do have to have a language domain where you make that ironclad promise to turn off English. For our son, it's in his classroom and it's a long day, six, what, seven hours in there, absolutely no English. For us, it's our grandkids. And actually now it's all the kids at our school. So all 70 kids at our school, we have that same fundamental promise. We will never speak English to you. And we speak to them in Salish. And that's our domain. It's not a place. It's a set of relationships. And it's goofy that we haven't expanded that, but life is hard sometimes. So another hallmark of our uh, fluency transfer system that is based on a curriculum 
And that curriculum was just made by Larray and I and one fluent elder. And that's what it took to move us up to become advanced fluent speakers. And um, some people lament, oh, I've only got six elders who are willing to meet with me. And I'm like, are you kidding me? We had one who was willing to take us in and get this done. And Sam Tietze did do that. Um, and we've built, we figure uh, it took 10,000 hours to build a systematic second language acquisition curriculum that is just rich with cultural understandings. Um, so our Sage Curriculum Project, the idea is that we would move through these materials that we develop with Sam Tietze uh, so that we could become highly fluent and then actually begin our deep cultural education with uh, the fluent elders who remain, who are culturally active, right? Um, so our curriculum project inside of our fluency transfer system, the first element of our transfer system is this, this Salish curriculum that's taught by apprentice speakers whose goal is to create new advanced fluent speakers. Um, the curriculum itself divides into three levels. And at each level, there's a language book and a literature book. And these other titles in here, um, we've developed some of these books in different uh, Southern and Tier Salish languages. So book one has been done in Kavala Okanagan, in Spokane Kalispell, and in Wenatchee Columbian. It, uh, um, it's actually almost done in Coeur d'Alene. We'll be able to add Coeur d'Alene, the fourth language, very soon. The level one literature book has been done in those three languages. Uh, the level two language book has been done all three of those language. Uh, the remaining books, level two literature, level three language, that should say level three right there, that's a typo. And level three literature have both been done in Inselchtin, Kavala Okanagan, and in Kalispel. Um, so I have some timelines on this slide that I hope you're able to see. Um, how long it takes if you were to do full-time study of these materials, how long would it take you to move through this entire curriculum and be, uh, have advanced proficiency in one of the stage languages for which the books exist. So we do book one in three weeks. Many, many times we've taught the entire book one in three week intensives. Uh, we used to do that a lot before we started the school and now our school is a year round school. So, um, we haven't done that much. Uh, the level one uh, language uh, literature book can be very well taught in seven weeks. So in 10 weeks, in other words, a nice summer block, you can teach the entire level one of the curriculum. And then you actually have people with the very first level of proficiency. Like they'll start to follow along like, what's going on? What are they praying about? Um, the level two language book can be completed in eight weeks if you do full-time study. The level two liter a literature book can be done in eight weeks full-time study. The level three language book is quite large, uh, but it can be done in 16 weeks of full-time study. And the level three literature book can be learned and mastered in 10 weeks of full-time study. Full-time for us is, you know, nine hours a day with a half hour lunch break and you get Christmas off. So the long and short is it takes 52 weeks to become a fluent speaker of Insoch Chin or Kalispel, it takes a year if you did full-time study, then you would be a fluent speaker. You could go to the elders and just do, you could advance your knowledge and your cultural understandings just 100% in the language. You would have no recourse for English. You could learn everything you need to know uh, inside of the language package. You would be an advanced fluent speaker. That means you have a strong uh, grammatical grasp um, you, you'll be using advanced, correct grammatical speech across cases and tenses and aspects and paradigms. And then you'll also have a tremendous background in the culture in one year of study. So our level one, it's very much, um, it's a communicative approach. The methodologies that are used to teach it are all immersion methodologies, but it's a, it's a mishmash of stolen and pirated and Frankenstein methodologies. But it is based upon uh, the, mid, the written materials are very much an audiolingual approach. There are some words and there are some phrases we can sub those words into, and then we can use an immersion approach to uh, practice gaining that particular communicative co competency. This one would be talking about where plants grow. 
Um, at the level one literature, um, we take in, in our particular version, our cultural protocols and all elder allowed us to use traditional stories and we make very simple versions of them so that a beginning learner can still essentially learn a traditional story through whole language. Our partners in Montana have written original stories and translated those, but the, the, the notion is the same, that we can make a micro story and learn entire sentences through whole language and then add details to that story and grow it out into a mini story of a, of a larger story. Um, so when we're doing that in level one, we really look out for and respect the natural language six, uh, sequence and we use a, a direct acquisition methodology. So when I talk about the natural language sequence, I'm talking about the fact that all human beings are expert language teachers when we're teaching children to speak languages. Uh, obviously, most children on earth become fluent in one or more languages by age five, and there's no curriculum or teaching methodologies that are taught or presented. Uh, their teachers are their families, and their families are tremendously successful in uh, transferring their fluency to their children. There's really no cases on earth where we say, well, they've had a baby. I wonder if they'll be able to teach it their language. We'll just have to see. Maybe the child just won't be a speaker after five years. Uh, well, never. We never expect that. Uh, we fundamentally understand that every single human family is automatically a very gifted and successful language teaching uh, curriculum and, and faculty. They're all going to be successful across the board. Um, some, you know, more than others, but we have no expectation that the child's not gonna be speak any language when they're five. They're all gonna speak a language or, or more, more than one language. All children are highly fluent by age 10 and they've been taught primarily by their families. So all families are expert language teachers unless they go to teach adults, then they're terrible. But when we're teaching children, we can understand, oh, uh, we know exactly what to do. When they're first born, even before they're born, it's a time where we just speak to them and speak to them and speak to them, and they're developing comprehension and recognition of the phonemes and the, and the linguistic norms of their language. How's their pronunciation? We don't care. Um, do we talk to them about, hey, a little baby? Uh, now, I understand that the Affordable Care Act is probably going to come up against the Supreme Court when we have this new justice. No, that's not how we talk to them. We go up to their face like, hey, baby, what are you doing? And all human beings do that. We change the tone of our voice. We change our proximity to the learner. We engage in particular kinds of discourse that are meant to bridge the comprehension gap of that new learner who is a baby and bring them towards fluency. And it takes some time. So we do lots of that kind of talking when they're one and two year old. When they uh, approach two, we expect them to understand. So we say things like, where's your little bear? Go get your little bear. Where is it? That's right. And they grab it and bring it back. And they're like, that's right. Give me that bear. You give me that bear. Oh, you're so fuzzy. We do all this really very precise language teaching with tone of voice and we're always gauging what we think the learner can understand and we're always pushing them a little further to understand more and we give them very sensible feedback about how much they're understanding and then we really push them to produce. Say daddy, 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 daddy. You know when mom's out of the room, daddy, 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 daddy. Oh, we say it a hundred times because we want them to say daddy before mama. Right, and that happened to me, right? I do tell this story, so some of you heard it, but my daughter's first word was da. And I was like, boom, I win. Daddy is the first word, mama loses, but then she walked to our dog. It turns out our daughter's first word, da, referred to dog. Her first word was dog, it was not da. Now you can imagine what I did, I went to the whiteboard and I got a pen and I wrote all the letters D, O, G, and D, A, D, and then we individually practiced each one of those sounds corresponding to the alphabet so that she would have correct pronunciation and not offend a fluent speaker. That's what I did not, because no one does that. She, she 
I misunderstood. I had my feelings hurt by this new speaker. And I told her that was great. I said, dog, oh yeah, that's nice, Sophie. She's such a dog, 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 oh, that. Look at, and then Lorraine came home and I said, oh, she can say dog. And we said dog a million times. And anybody came over to the house, we said, all right, get the baby out and get that, we'll do the dog trick. Get her to say dog, 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 dog. At no time did I correct her or talk about my hurt feelings or admit that I had lost the contest of first work. I just told her it was great and said dog, dog, dog a million times. And then Lorraine out of the room, we worked on dad, dad, dad. But it was all just a happy and joyous occasion, even though in reality, she mispronounced, she violated the fluent speaker's feelings and expectations. And we told her that was just fine. And that's what we always do when we're doing our expert language teaching. Unfortunately, uh, in our adult classrooms, inside of our indigenous language efforts doing community language services, we often will respond in that horrible way when somebody tries to speak. We'll harshly reprimand them. If they've made somebody misunderstand, like, oh man, there's famous stories in Salish. It's just that little difference between uh, I reached inside your purse and I reached inside someplace no one should ever reach inside. One little letter changes the meaning. And it can be very weird and uh, the learners are saying all kinds of crazy things. As expert language teachers, we know we need to give them reinforcement. We need to laugh along with them. We need to just practice and communicate and live the language and then they will get better and their pronunciation will get better. And we could spend a little time talking about a little structure. You know, adults are crafty learners. So if we expose patterns or give them pointers, they can accelerate their language learning, but um, it has to be in that same beautiful way that we do during the natural language sequence when we're teaching children. We all learn in steps. We have to have a chance to recognize and hear the language. Then we have to be able to show our comprehension without having to produce. And when we begin to produce for a fact, we will be bad because all new language speakers of any language are bad. And you can't be good unless you've been bad first. There's no waiting. Oh, I'm just going to run drills and run lines and shoot three throws. And I'll just do all these drills. And then I'll step into the game and I'll school them. No. The only way you'll be good in the game is if you play the game. And you know how you get really good in the game? Play somebody who's better than you, who beats you every time. That's why you're really good, kid. And likewise for language. We have to get in there and get beaten and struggle and get outscored, but we're in the game and that's how our skills increase. We can't run drills, we can't talk word morphology. We have to live the language if we're really gonna become strong pronouncers and users of the language. Pronunciation develops independently from fluency, but it's, it's also co-occurrent. I always think about, I studied Spanish in college with a guy named Jose Alonso, he was one of my favorite college professors. And he had lived in the United States for 30 years at that time. And when he spoke English, he still spoke English with a bitty, heavy a Spanish accent. He could not speak English without a, a heavy Spanish accent. But then one time we were having coffee and we speak Spanish, right? But then he imitated American and he said, oh, I guess I'll have my cup of coffee. And he could speak English with a perfect American accent if he chose. That didn't mean he wasn't fluent in English. He was fluent in English. He was just uh, basically to punish Americans, he refused to speak with an English accent. He spoke English with a Spanish accent because that's who he was. And it didn't mean he wasn't fluent in English. He had a PhD from the University of Colorado. He is fluent in English. Um, and he actually spoke English with his children, ironically but he did it in a Spanish accent. Pronunciation and accent are not fluency. Pronunciation and accent are not proficiency. They can contribute to proficiency and they typically co-occur. The more uh, proficient you become in communicating, and you, if you're in a language culture community and you're doing revitalization work, so you're living the language, um, it's pretty hard not to have your, your pronunciation improve it's pretty hard not to speak with a better accent just because uh, it gets, starts to be pretty funny if you don't. Um, and people get better. And as adult learners, we can reach a certain level and then we actually can just work on it. And, we can, and with my students, I speak Salish with uh, 
a Spanish accent sometimes to, to draw out the notion to them that they can speak with an accent. Um, and it freaks them out when I speak Salish with a Mexican accent or I speak Salish with an English accent. Um, and we have a joke in my class because we sometimes speak Salish with an Irish accent. There's something about past participles and in self chain. Like, what did you kick is steam ash turk. And there's something about that makes us want to say, ah, steam ash turk, and kind of speak with a terrible uh, imitative Irish accent. So, but it helps our learners to think about accent and pronunciation and how that can co-occur with fluency and proficiency and come together to, to make you a, a more effective speaker. Um, the goal of direct acquisition, right, is to acquire and use language. So people are often a little bit baffled by our beginning language courses because we don't do reading and writing in class and they don't have a text in class to refer to. It's very much all spoken. It's, it's listening, understanding, and beginning to produce language. Um, and we're very strict about that typically. Um, because it really pushes them to acquire the phonemes and, uh, and, and be able to recognize the phonemes of the language. And most of our adult learners are able to acquire the phonemes more slowly when they're exposed to the written text uh, ahead of time. And that's just our experience. Um, level two of our curriculum, still the, the written materials still have very much an audiolingual format. So there are words, there are phrases we can substitute those words in. And in level two, we, um, in level one, it's so really radically whole language, no reading and writing in class, uh, just hearing, understanding, reproducing and communicating. But in level two, we jump right into verb paradigms and we conjugate verbs and we, uh, adult learners can accelerate their proficiency um, by understanding patterns and applying them outside of their linguistic experience. Research clearly shows it. Kids are not better language learners than adults. Adults, adults are better language learners because they're super sophisticated in their cognitive understandings. And so they can apply patterns more rapidly and effectively, um, but their accent will be worse typically than kids. Level two literature, um, again, we're, we're looking into deeper texts and we're, our focus besides, uh, for us, we're using traditional stories. So it has a, a huge cultural impact um, when we teach the literature but we're focusing on being able to make verbal exchanges in communication. So, you know, it's a class, I, even when I taught high school Spanish, I'd ask some kid, te gusta la pizza? Do you like pizza? And of course, when they responded, they, they failed to make a flip to first person. They would respond also in second person. They'd say, si, te gusta la pizza? Yes, you like pizza. I'd say, no, no me gusta la pizza. Te gusta la pizza? They say, si, te gusta la pizza? And they're just failing to make the verbal flip, right? Because that's very difficult in a second language, but that's what we really want to focus on. And then they would get it and say like, oh yeah, the question says te gusta, but when I answer, I have to say me gusta. I'm making a verbal exchange between first and second person. I needed to be able to do that in singular and plural, right? And really that's a big focus of level two, introducing all kinds of verb forms. And then can we make verbal exchanges? So even when we deal with the literature, um, we understand the story, we learn about the cultural uh, frameworks that go along with the story, but a lot of their task is, once they understand the story, can you tell that story from different points of view? Can you take that story and do uh, verbal transformation? So instead of, um, I don't know, this says, three brothers were living in the Smilkameen Valley, how would you say me and my brothers, me and my brothers, so we were living in the Smilkameen Valley. Can you make those verbal exchanges and do point of view changes? Um, because those are fundamental to communication. In communication, we're either uh, transmitting a narrative, receiving a narrative, asking a question or answering a question, right? These are the prime communicative tasks and so many of those require uh, a verbal exchange, especially in, question, especially in questioning. We do lots of grammatical practice, but it's grammatical practice for communication. So we tend not to, our, our students tend not to have a strong grasp of linguistic terminology 
which is so present in indigenous language communities. And there's so many people who have attempted to achieve language revitalization by studying linguistics or being involved in linguistic studies and descriptive linguistics. Um, our folks do there, we expose them particular grammatical terminology just to help them out. Like we're gonna call this the progressive, we're gonna call this the durative. Um, and we don't dwell on what those particularly mean other than, so if you're gonna start an action and then continue on with that action, we can use the durative construction for that. So we do grammatical practice, cons uh, considerable amounts of grammatical practice, but it's in the language. It's not explanations in English primarily. And it's all about gaining proficiency and making verbal transformations for communication. Uh, at level three, we really get into huge cultural texts. Uh, there's some English in the text just to highlight new vocabulary words, but we do lots of question answering, talking about application of the cultural teachings, um, and it's a full immersion, it's essentially a full immersion cultural workshop um, where we're talking about cultural practices or particular plants or animals, their life cycle and whatnot. You know, and of course, all of these from the very beginning of this curriculum to the very end, it's taught through full immersion. Um, we do lots of, we pr provide them with lots of grammatical practice. We ask them, so Salish has a very complex transitive system. So to do verbal exchanges in tra with transitive verbs with objects is, uh, it's really hard to learn. And it's really hard to put in your mouth so that you can use those, that transitive system on the fly. So we just do massive drilling of, of can we form it? Could you know how to form all of, we use a 36 box. Can you say, he saw me, he saw her, he saw you guys, we saw you guys, you guys saw her, they saw us, they are seeing us, they are going to be seeing us, you guys are going to be seeing them. We have to be able to make all these uh, verbal flips in the transit system um, with objects. And it's very complex in Salish. And our level three students, we just drill it and drill it and practice it and talk it uh, until it can come out of our mouths when we're living the language. Um, same with the level three literature, we're looking at those verbal transformations. Can we expand on the story? Can we use that full, uh, all three broad grammatical paradigms in Southern Interior Salish uh, the intransitive paradigm, the transitive paradigm, and the durative possessive paradigm across all the different aspects. Um, so we want to be using any verb across all three paradigms and across at least nine aspects. So um, 27, each verb form, we want to be able to roll it across 27 forms and have that in our mouths when we are in level three of this curriculum. A decision Lorraine and I made with Sam Tietze very early on when we moved to Canada as illegal aliens was that we would see after our own fluency, but we would also pace our work so that it created a trail behind us that others could follow. Uh, and it was a conscious decision. I think our own fluency could have developed more rapidly just through kind of a natural immersion approach with Sam Tietze, uh, but we consciously chose to document and make curriculum um, and so that it would leave a permanent record and it would create that cartograph of linguistic and cultural information for others to follow. So we offer this system and our curriculum template to any indigenous language community that would like to adopt it. And we offer that at no cost as long as um, our work is recognized and we put it out on a free Creative Commons license. And there are indigenous people all around the world. So this curriculum is, we're now translating it into Irish, uh, which would be my heritage language before the genocidal activities took place in Ireland. It's being translated into Sorbian, which is an endangered Slavic language in former East Germany. So it's been, the first book has been translated into 17 North American indigenous languages. Uh, and then there are some groups that have done more. It's more than, been more than the flavor of the week. So the Seal Language House in West Bank, British Columbia, uh, we share the same language with them and they have uh, a, the 
the other really strong program that's training new adult fluent speakers of Inselk Chin. Uh, our partners, Inchilem Language and Culture Association, are also training new adult fluent speakers. Um, and the Okanagan, or excuse me, the Osuyus Indian Band Language House and the Tiku Tihailach Indigenous Association, uh, they are all really active using this methodology to teach in Selk Chin, Kavl Okanagan, and they have taken new learners beyond the beginning level successfully. Uh, Cheney's, uh, our host today, um, is with the Salish Culture Committee. They're in partnership with Salish Kootenakali, the Kalispell Tribe, and the Nkusum Language Institute and the school that Nkusum runs. They are doing all of this work in our sister language in, uh, in I guess we call it in Selishtsin, um, which is our sister language, uh, Spokane Kalispell. And they've had excellent success in bringing students uh, beyond the intermediate level. So they are beginning to create advanced fluent speakers using this same fluency transfer system that's anchored by the Salish curriculum and that immersion and strong language domains where English is turned off. Some other folks uh, are, the children of the Taku Society is developing this curriculum in uh, Clinkett. And uh, they're working on the third book right now, but they've also, um, they've gone much slower on curriculum development, but they've also really mastered the curriculum. So they are fresh off a uh, language evaluation by the powers that be. And their new learners who've been following this curriculum and have only studied the first two and a half books all got an intermediate proficiency evaluation uh, from the powers that be in, up in uh, Alaska and the Yukon. So that's an amazing achievement. So, and they continue to press forward making these books. Uh, we also have partners at Suminas who are working, have been working on the first two books um, and partners with the Shushwap at Nesconleth uh, Indian Band have done the first, I believe they've done the both level one books and they're working on a level two book. COVID has slowed folks down. And then our Sahapta neighbors to the south have most, they've all produced the first book and have had some success with that. So I'm gonna get a little bit preachy and odd to finish here um, because I do really wanna ground our work in, in, a, in, a, in a deeper idea. So I, I, uh, when I was first brought into this, Lorraine, I team taught a sixth, seventh and eighth grade at Well Pennant Middle School on the Spokane Indian Reservation. And I was, I, I was teaching Spanish two days a week two and a half days a week, and we're teaching Spokane Salish two and a half days a week. And uh, some point in the course of teaching, I said something about my culture. And all those kids said, white people don't have culture? What are you talking about? You don't have the, and, and, it, and it really brought forward a great conversation about human culture and introducing them to a more anthropological uh, definition of culture, that all human beings have culture. But it also drew out the fact that because of the history of genocide and colonialism, our Salish culture has been reified. It's been, it's been ripped asunder from, it had been torn from these kids and it became something that they viewed as separate from themselves. It was not their culture, it was the culture. And there were people who were really into the culture and they wanted to learn to respect the culture, but it, they weren't exactly talking about it like it was their own authentic culture. And um, we understand that that's very common in post-genocidal societies. Um, and it's, it's really challenging for our students. So we have some kids who have aged up in our school. They were uh, these two Harry Potter fanatics. I hope you can see the slide. Um, they've been with us since they were three and four years old and they're now 13 and 14. And uh, they've grown up inside of the language and culture, um, but they've also grown up in this 21st century globalized culture where you really, I mean, there are more speakers of Klingon on earth than there are speakers of Inselk Chin, Kabul Okanagan. And, and that's the nature of the 21st century, where a wholly fabricated um, language from a TV and movie 
there, there's some people who raise their kid as a Klingon speaker um, to some degree, and they get together and have Klingon tertulia. They have conversation groups in Klingon. Uh, wow. Uh, and yet we struggle to just <laughs> have a consistent body of new learners of Insel Chin. But this, this contemporary culture has quick mobility, new cultural production, uh, contrived culture like Klingon. Oh, I'm, I'm Klingon. I, I, I like to think of myself as culturally Klingon. What the heck? And we have all these tertiary relationships where we're in relationships with people who we don't ever physically meet. Um, uh, and that, that calls for different kinds of cultural protocols. And it's all very challenging for our young people. Um, and so we're really in this conversation with them about ultimately we want our kids to be happy. That's it. Um, we want them to be happy and, and have a beautiful life, have a life in which they experience and create beauty. And we want them to be happy. And we talked to them about this formula. There's even great research now, global research about it's, it's pretty much straightforward. All human beings have to have basic health and wealth to be happy. Um, and it's not that much wealth. Globally, it's like after you have $18,000 adjusted for currency and cost of living in various places, once you have $18,000, how much money you have doesn't actually contribute very much to your happiness. Uh, but you have to have that much or you're less happy than other people. Um, and you have to have your health. If you're struggling with your physical or mental health, uh, you, it's hard to be happy, right? And we need relationships. People who aren't in a web of relationships are typically less happy than other people. And we have to have a sense of identity and purpose. So even though I know lots of people and I chat around and I have some money and I, um, uh, I have good health, people who do not have a strong personal purpose and identity tend to be less happy than other people. And we're really trying to talk about our kids about this now. And we're selling them a bill of goods. And the bill of goods we're selling them is, and this is our assertion, that the best individuals and the best cultures make goodness and beauty and service to others the core of their identity and purpose. And we can usually get them to admit that, even though they don't know about that service stuff. Uh, and then we tell them this. Our Salish cultural package is a proven blueprint for a happy and moral life. That if you really dig into this language you're learning and embrace it and the culture that has come with it and the culture that you've become to understand and the standards we've held you to, if you dig into that and make that who you are, you will be happy and you will have a beautiful life. And that is the fundamental purpose of all of our work here. That is the fundamental driving force of language revitalization work. And that is the fundamental driving force that can hold a language culture community together. It's very difficult in this 21st century world where the dominant society is doing everything it can to peel us away from one another, to isolate us with our own consumption and preferences and feelings of the moment. And what language revitalization is calling us is to do is to come together to make a promise to each other, even when we don't like each other and sometimes can't stand each other, and to hold true to that promise in a way that will ultimately lead us all to have happier lives and surround us with beauty. So there's a picture of me and my better half because that's ultimately what it's all about. And so I, at the beginning, I talked about the facts that no language is endangered as in South Chin has ever been, has ever become uh, a first language again. It's just never been done. Um, but to hell with the facts, uh, the destiny of the world is determined less by the battles that are lost and won than by the stories it loves and believes in. And to bring our community together into a revitalization language and culture community, we have to have our story. We have to know what we ultimately are doing. This guy on 
this grown man on, it's on my left. I don't know how you're seeing it. That's my father-in-law, Les Wiley. He was the first person in a genealogical line stretching back 10,000 years who did not grow up speaking Salish. And his mother did not teach him Salish because she loved him so much and because she wanted to spare him the violence, brutality, and discrimination that she had faced and survived. It was an act of love that she did not teach him the language. And uh, it's easy to think of our people as victims, but we also like to recognize that Elizabeth Barr had agency and she made choices and she rolled the dice and made a bet. And it turns out in this case, she was right. He went through a lot, but he was able to raise his children. He was able to provide for his family. A bunch of his children went to college. One of his children went to his uncle's funeral and she became fluent in that language of her grandmother. And she has successfully transmitted that language to her children and to her grandchildren. And it is our story, our hope is that maybe that baby he's holding, that was Lorraine I's first grandchild, and that's his first grandchild, and she has always grown up with the language. And she was the first in many generations to do her coming of age ceremonies. And she can sing Aretha Franklin's respect in Salish like nothing. You should hear that. Um, and she might be the first of a genealogical line spanning 10,000 years of people who speak Salish and maybe three or four other languages as it should be. All of this dream, all of this story, all of this work came out of an act and the Salish word for that is tsakaspu'us. This person was heartstruck, and she made the decision that she would learn her language, that she would m cut a trail for others to follow. And the thing about her and this effort and everything that happens at Salish School of Spokane, and even the fact that an Irish-American guy like I who used to be a Spanish teacher and had never heard even heard a Salish word until he was almost 40 years old, is that she just won't quit. And so I show this picture of Larray Wiley last. She's the founder of Sayer School Spokane. She's the one who went on this journey, who connected up with Sam Tiza, who ended up making all of us in her family fluent speakers. And on a certain level, it was her, just her in that moment when she was stuck and she made a determination and that has never relinquished that determination. She has never quit. Um, and with an open hand and open heart, she has brought her language back towards the other side. And we're hopeful for that story to, to continue and unfold. And I close in this way because any one of you can do the same. If you make that determination and then you just don't quit. And that's the end of my talk. There's only three people still signed in. Oh, oh no. Just kidding. Do you have any comments, Cheney? Or well, I'm quite well much, Chris. Um, that was awesome. I appreciate it. Is there any questions from anybody? <laughs>